Um, I would like to go ahead and uh, introduce our um, next workshop and, of course, our uh, workshop presenter, uh, which is Professor Levine. And you, you already heard um, so much about her uh, project, but I'd uh, like to say a few words on uh, her as well. Um, she's uh, at the Central Washington University, and um, we already heard she's a professor of history. Um, and she, uh, as we have also seen, um, focus on um, Chinese political party formation. And I would still like to emphasize that um, the Chinese biographical database that she has um, uh, compiled, that was really one of the first uh, projects um, that actually try to compile and make accessible these um, uh, such large data sets. And um, especially um, also drawing on interviews, uh, which I think is uh, quite unique. And um, uh, right now she will um, talk to us about hierarchical clustering and heat maps. And so there again, you are uh, one of the uh, very few people who actually do that in uh, historical research, uh, in historical network research. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, your introduction for us on this topic. So I will be presenting uh, a different tool than has been presented. So this is a hierarchical clustering and heat maps. And uh, basically, I will be talking about, uh, first of all, give a summary introduction to quantitative approaches. And I want you to actually consider the idea that uh, there's a, an array of tools. We just heard brilliant presentations on, from all the presenters so far, and also the other two days, on quantitative approaches, network approaches. And I want to suggest to you hierarchical clustering, I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment. I will introduce everything very carefully. I'm not going to use per se the Soviet returned leaders and in the must read folder, I do have the data I'm using the Lua, uh, Lua data. And uh, I'm gonna give an introduction uh, about what is hierarchical clustering and then Southern women data set, which is the first one. I'm gonna teach you how to do the computations, linkages, uh, how do we decide one of the questions got to this, where do you make these decisions, what, is it valid? And we're gonna look at that. And then we're gonna look at cluster analyses and rows and columns, sort of in the watermark here, you can see a cluster analysis. And then we're going to look at the case study, the Chinese students in uh, Europe data set. And, uh, and we're gonna look at heat maps uh, as well. And what I'm going to do is I'm dividing this into two so you have a chance to ask questions. So we'll have the demonstration of Orange, which uh, is a very easy to use program for higher, uh, heat cl uh, hierarchical clustering or HCA. I'm going to show you a couple of Chinese examples and then we'll go ahead and uh, do that. The case study that I'm going to use after we do Southern Women data set is are the Chinese students in Europe. That's why I mentioned Xu De Hung. I was very happy uh, and Laudra and John uh, that uh, uh, Henrique did that. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that data set. I'm gonna give some examples. Also on how do you analyze it? I think it's really important. You can get carried away with graphs and, and all that, but what does it mean? And what can you extract from the attributes and the quantitation of what you're doing? Uh, and, and again, there's been a good foundation to ask those questions in previous uh, talks. Then we're gonna look at what is a heat map. I'm gonna show you the earliest heat map, uh, I think is a uh, Toussaint Lua, uh, the Atlas Statistique de la Population de Paris. And I'm gonna actually use this and I've uploaded the range database uh, data set. So you can practice in orange with this data set uh, yourself. Uh, and resources. I'm also going to post a step-by-step -step guide to Orange, uh, to Orange, and uh, I'm going to look at resources and uh, a summary. And then again, we're going to do a demonstration with a chance for you to ask some questions. So uh, this is just some possible quantitative approaches. I'm not going to go into all of these approaches, but basically univariate statistics, multivariate statistics. Cluster analysis is part of multivariate statistics, but you can have factor analysis as well or principal component analysis, which 
I put, I put several, I put a whole file with several key articles on these areas for you. And you can look at the Patel one, which was the, the uh, earliest, multidimensional scaling and so on. Then you can do graphs, uh, frequency distributions and so on. We're gonna look at a type of graph called dendrograms, tree or circular graphs. And it'll become very obvious to you. And there's not a lot of technical terms in what I'm talking about. So I think it'll be uh, accessible. And we're gonna look at the heat maps. But before we begin that, and then there's geospatial analysis you see a lot. We see network analysis, which is the primary ones you've been seeing, and uh, content analysis, uh, which we had a fabulous demonstration, really relevant. So here we want to say research study decisions. And you saw some of those in action today with my fellow panelists. What is the relevant historical context from which populations are data drawn from? Which data will be collected. How are the data defined and encoded? So for example, in Alex's presentation and in my presentation, you know, we don't particularly do the time data right now, but at some point I will add time series. Uh, what is the range and limit? So that's a limitation of my work in the CBD, for example, but the range is the entire 20th century. Uh, up until probably the uh, 1970s. What will be quantified? Uh, what are, what, this is a, we'll answer in this paper, which normalization can you use for disparate variable scales? And that's popped up in the previous week where someone had positive and negative data uh, results in their tables. How do you deal with that? Which analytical methods will be used? How will the results best be shown? But let me just say, having done some uh, independent studies with students and creating a digital history course, which I'm in the process, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's my opinion, of time and effort are in collecting and organizing for the analysis. One of the cool things is that these programs do the work for you. You don't have to know the algorithms necessarily, um, uh, you know, unless you're, you are from a computer science uh, background, but historians can avail themselves of these opportunities uh, and focus on the data and the analyses, uh, and it's really fun. So the definition of hierarchical cluster analysis, or HCA, is a multivariate statistical method used for calculating similarities and dissimilarities for discovering subgroups or clusters with multiple variable data with visualization via graphs, such as a dendrogram. So you use a, the trunk is uh, there, and then you have all the branches. And how do they cluster together? So for example, I'm not going to be showing this, but in one in my Soviet return leader, you always find Joe and Lai is so unique that he actually is in his own cluster. And another cluster is Sai Chang and Li Fu Chuan, husband and wife, prominent CCP members. They always actually almost form a dyad if you, if you put them in a dendrogram, and no matter what data set. Uh, the algorithm for hierarchical clustering analysis is accomplished via agglomerative or a top bottom up or top down approaches by calculating distances. I'm going to go into each of these parts very carefully. Uh, I use it, happen to use Euclidean, and I tell you why. And then using linkage criteria, which I will also go into to determine cluster membership. So those are the two uh, settings that you want to be able to have. In this slide, I just want to show you that this is not really something new. You actually have the tree of Jesse here, uh, which is uh, covers the lives of various saints and classical leaders. I think Alex will like this. And basically it's a, it's a dendrogram. It's a tree diagram of how these saints uh, go together. The second is a polar or circular dendrogram. And in uh, Manuel Lima's fabulous work on the book of trees, you see there's quite a few different types of a tree diagram. So this is a circular one, but it's still a, a, a dendrogram. It's still a tree diagram. Uh, and then you see a literal tree in the last two. One is the uh, genealogy. And this was a great boon to tree diagrams of the Lee family of Virginia and Maryland made in 1886. And then the earliest, uh, I think, a dendrogram from uh, 1295, the tree of science. Uh, and you can see he has the branches of science, literally his branches, the roots of science. Uh, and it's really an interesting uh, diagram. For modern purposes, 
the uh, most important uh, study has, uh, that has been studied and restudied. I, in the uh, folder, I give you an article by Linton Freeman, who talks about 21 different meta studies of the Southern women. And here you have the original data. Basically, this was a book called Deep South from 1941 by Davis Gardner and Gardner. And they were looking at racism and social relations in the South. And one of the things they did was they interviewed 18 women who attended 14 events and wanted to look in the nature of that. Now to protect the privacy of the city, which they thought could be identified, they actually never identify what each event is. They just label them. And so this is the only sentence that can actually help you. But joint activities like a day's work behind the counter of a store, uh, the meeting of a women's club, a church uh, party, a uh, summer, uh, a supper party, a meeting of the Parent Teacher Association. And here you see, uh, Southern women with uh, at a social event. And so you see some of these women have higher participation and some of them have lower participation. And basically, if you wanted to take the data and you put it in this zero for non-participation for that event, one for participation, you then compute what's called the Euclidean distances. And uh, you do that through the programs. This is done through uh, uh, SysDat where you just put in what you want to add, how you want to do it. But you can also do this. I'm going to show you how to do it through Orange. So you just have the one program today. Now, uh, this is, uh, you can see these are examples of the distances. And you use it to figure out cluster analyses or similarities uh, of distance. And I'll show you how that looks in a minute. I just want to do want to show you that uh, I used Euclidean distance because it is a common measure and can be used consistently across all analyses. But you can use any of these uh, uh, hierarchical clustering distance choices. And you might want to, your data may be different, and you might want to try a different one. Also, linkage choices. How do you actually link the data together? So this is how you compute the distance, which is the key to hierarchical clustering. You have to know how uh, what is the distance between them by their similarities. It's not just the number of variables. It's, it's a, a complicated algorithm, but we don't have to fortunately know all that. But you, here are some hierarchical clustering linkages. I choose Ward because I'm an historian and I like a stringent method and it matched the historical record. You want to experiment a bit and say, well, what do you know about some internal references? People who you know had uh, uh, linkages together that were pretty close like some of the questions you asked actually on Judah. So you have average, uh, you can have word, uh, but there's other ones that uh, are looser connections. Uh, it's easier to get in the group, so to speak, uh, for, for being linked. Okay, so this is uh, the uh, example of a hierarchical cluster analysis. So here's the eight, 18 women. And you see that in these uh, women, there's, I put this at four clusters. I'm gonna show you two, an example of at three, but I like the idea of Olivia and Flora having their own dyad because you see that if you look at the data, you can see that they have uh, the two in event uh, nine and event 11 together. They actually only have those two together. That's why they're flat because there's no distance between them. And then if you see the other participants, they have variable uh, uh, ones. And if you actually want to look at Sylvia and Charlotte and Evelyn, uh, you can see that they have, uh, that the, these distances really reflect their uh, participation in those events. So how do you have a uh, uh, recognized cluster linkage level patterns? And this is something that you may not have thought you can do, but you can do it. It's actually not that difficult. You study the horizontal linkage level. So in this particular example taken from one of the articles I loaded, you can see that uh, you can load them at levels that they connect on A, B shows another level, C shows another level. So um, uh, you can see that. Uh, the correct number of clusters, which I showed you an example with four uh, clusters, so that's what this is. Each of these is a cluster. You can see, for example, Sylvia and Mir uh, Mirna collect here, uh, but Sylvia and uh, Nora and Helen collect there. Uh, and you can see how these people connect. And then you can see the broader areas of cluster one connects with cluster twos through four here. So it, you, that's what a cluster is. And so you can actually see what makes more sense. 
So uh, internal statistical measurements of variance within clusters. This was done through SysStat. Again, you can uh, it's six different measurements, and you can see that it validates, you know, between by and large out of these ones between three and four. I told, told you my views on four, but you could just as easily do three. Uh, and you want to make sure you have some reference cases so you know who had relationships with who and who was close with who, so that you can see if it makes sense. Also, cut points based on linkage joining behavior, which I just showed you. You also have external known historical record grounded in truth, uh, which uh, again, as historians, we, we sort of know who did link with who and is it making sense? But remember, it's only valid for that data set. And this is another example of that database, uh, that data set of Southern women. This is if it had three, you can see Olivia and Flora uh, connecting there. But I think, the, I think this one here where there's four I, I personally like that, but you could do three or four. And also, as I said, uh, uh, there's an article that actually analyzes 21 different analyses of that Southern Women data set to get to what are the best algorithms and some of the procedural issues. This is a cluster analysis of columns. So th these are cluster analysis of rows. And uh, that's the uh, people who connect with people. This is the cluster analysis of events. So uh, I'll show you when we do the orange demonstration that you can actually also do the attributes and see which attributes uh, cluster with which attributes. And so this, there's essentially two and you see particularly E10 and E12, for example, cluster very close together. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into the Chinese biographical database. Again, again, there's a, there's a paper there that explains it in greater detail, particularly how the evidence was gathered in archives and so on. This is on the Chinese students in Europe group. Uh, this was a workshop I gave at Sun Yat-sen University before COVID hit. And basically it centers on institutions in Lyon, Paris, Charleroi, uh, Belgium, and Berlin, Germany. So uh, this is uh, students who sought education in Europe during the interwar years in the 20th century. Uh, in fact, I had a question on Deng Yanda and I wanted to say that you know, there, there's a wide array there. I have a lot of American students who studied in the United States. Uh, there's about uh, 1000 students who, who went to Europe, students and political activists who went to Europe during the 1920s in my database, the Chinese biographical database, but there's also many more added. The CSE was created in the fall of 2019 and it numbers 197 individuals. There's a couple of other institutions, but primarily it, there's 90 people from the Institut Franco-Chinois. There's 66 people from the Université du Travail Charleroi. There's 19 people from the Université de Paris and the University of Schwarzu Berlin is uh, numbering at 17. So these are some of the attributes. Um, actually, it's interesting, there's a little more about 10% of women in the data set, uh, usually it's 7 to 10%. And I think Peter Bull uh, had about the same percentage. It was very interesting. I was very interested to hear that. One of the characteristics of this data set is uh, other data sets I study often have a preponderance of communist affiliation. This one has European Guomindang affiliation. There's 71 people out of the 100 and... Uh, uh, 97 individuals who actually you can trace belong to a party. And I want to say, how did I get the affiliation? Uh, there are several archival references. There's memoirs. There's cap the bless the French Sûreté. The Sûreté captured meeting minutes. So we know, for example, Deng Xiaoping actually led an AGMD meeting where he expelled the right wing AGMD people. Uh, but that again is validated in a 1929 captured document in Chinese. It's in the book, the uh, EGDMD, uh, at we, Chen Sanjing and I translated 72 documents and you can get the full tables from that. It's absolutely astonishing. So we got a lot of these memberships from there. And I also wanna mention Xu Wentong, uh, Academia Sinica, his brilliant uh, study on the political party formation he has a lot of people listed that he also did research to get to. So you see, for example, uh, uh, the uh, different uh, things. This is the one data set I have where Guangdong actually shows up uh, with 47 people, 32 from Hunan and 28 from Sichuan and 19 from Jiangsu. 
Uh, I also want to mention that you have Gung Yu Shu, you have the anarchists, you actually have seven members uh, of the anarchists, we have the Social Democratic Party, as well as the uh, other ones, and the Qin Yandong. So this is uh, how a data set looks, and uh, this is the original. I also, I sort of put some columns M and N there so you could see. I do have comments uh, in, the, in the database uh, that I have, and so it's now in a spreadsheet. And, uh, and since I did the database in 1998, and it was available till 2006, but I also, uh, from 2018 onward, did research. So I put in a bunch of links uh, there and I have to say I have a sources table. Uh, there's over almost 6,000 sources used, uh, sometimes between five to 10, but I've updated those. And with some students, you'll see the verified column here. We actually verified the uh, dates and spelling. For example, Lanjun Jun was in my da original database a couple of times because she had different names. We were finally able to discover her name. It's Landrin Jen. So it Landrin Jen. So it's really interesting how you can do that. So I put a few representative uh, Democratic League, uh, Guomindang, uh, EGM, European Guomindang, European Communists. Huang Pu Military Academy is a pretty important one. And then uh, uh, for Alex, uh, I actually have over 260 young Catholic. Uh, people marked. Uh, this wasn't people who necessarily believed in Catholic, but Father Levy sent a, uh, a, a uh, gave aid in uh, Belgium and Belgium and uh, in France to, he didn't, was anti-communist and he wanted to present aid to the worker students. Many of them actually took the aid from the YCA, the Young Catholic Association. And so fortunately the French have every one of these and I have the whole data set if you need it. Uh, with uh, their names in French, so and in Chinese, so that that could be useful. Uh, now I want to show you that that's so we've gone through you know sort of a uh, what are the basic attributes of the CSC data set. This is what it looks like in a sample spreadsheet, giving you both the columns and the rows, uh, and then this is the data set that works out. And uh, obviously, you know, you'd have to parse this out into uh, really good graphics. If you were publishing this, you'd want to post a SVG or a PNG or a JPEG so people could really look at the names and manipulate the data and they can actually see clearly. Uh, but here I want to make a different point. I want to give some examples of historical discussion of these several clusters. And so I've divided it into left block and right block. And I want to mention that I, a point I was trying to make in that uh, two abbreviated PowerPoint discussion previously is, you know, we can use these to tell the stories, okay? That's what's exciting about this, isn't the quantitation. It's, it's like, what does it mean? So on the right block, cluster fo clusters focus, clusters one through two, and uh, that's uh, to the uh, right here, clusters, the blue and the orange and four through six, actually have a lot of affinities. 84 people are from the Institut franco Chinois de Lyon. So this is sort of the uh, Sino-French Institute people. They actually have 30 Guangdong individuals and 16 Hunan individuals. This is a hotbed for the European Kuomintang. And a lot of these people, and this is very interesting to the uh, Sino-Japanese war and so on. What's very interesting is a lot of these people were left-wing EGMD. You had some right-wing, but they primarily were in the Belgian cohort of the EGMD. And these left-wing people had several close followers of uh, Wang Jingwei, particularly uh, Chen Chuenpu and Chu Minyi, who, who actually is affiliated with the Institute, uh, is part of that gang, but not in this particular analysis. And you have 16 ECCO members or communists. What's so interesting about these people, and I did the uh, archival research at Lyon, uh, is you have so much documented by the uh, dossiers. So you have expulsions. And in 1927, So Lu, who was part of the Western Hills faction and ran the Chinese side of the Sino-French Institute of the Institut franco chinois à Lyon, he actually demanded that anybody the Cirité was finding to be a communist be expelled from the Institute. And there's several expulsion cases that take place. And the dossiers are so exciting to read. You get the inner workings of these groups and the dynamics of what people were thinking. 
Uh, you also have a tremendous amount of publication with a periodical called Guomin, and each faction took the Guomin and published what they thought about it. And you can actually trace the factional affiliation by the address on the masthead, which I do. There also were fistfights, and a gentleman called Peng Xiang, who was married to one of the famous Fan cousins uh, uh, and rates high in centralities, uh, Peng Xiang actually fought with a Chen Sunung, Shunung, and this was documented in the, uh, both in the dossiers and in the newspapers at the time, was seen as a big black eye for the Institute. You also have romances and marriages, and this is one of the famous ones, uh, Yang Kun and Zhang Ruming. Both of them were uh, belonging to the Communist Party. Zhang Ruming quit in 1924. She was the free romance for Zhou Enlai. Uh, they had a, a, she was a feminist in the May 4th movement. She went to jail for six months. She was not a worker student. She always wanted to be a student. She wrote elegant French. She won the award in 1930 for her thesis on Andre Gide. And they actually published her thesis. She gave it to Andre Gide. And if you go to those dossiers, you will see that you read or written from Andre Gide to John Roming in 1930 saying, thank you, for, thanks to you, I have recovered myself. Of course, it's in French. And Yang Quinn, also, she became, went back to China after they married in 1930. They were not allowed to marry while students. And Yang Quinn became a famous anthropologist and sociologist who had studied with Marcel Carnet and Marcel Maus in Paris at the Ethnology Institute. And he helped pioneer ethnology in China. Uh, and he was a communist member until 1927. When the expulsions were taking place, he was such a brilliant student. His teachers encouraged him to quit the party and he did. So these are two important people. And uh, of course, I, I had two interviews with uh, Yang Kun. So in 1985 and 1990, actually several sessions. And so this is a really an interesting figure, which I unfortunately don't have more time to talk about. You have Zhu Xi at the bottom, uh, who uh, was uh, archive number 222. He had actually studied also at Montpellier, one of the first two Chinese to study in Montpellier. And uh, his thesis in 1931, he talked about the work study movement, but he became a scientist and researcher and head of the Physiology Research Institute at the Beijing Yanzhou Yuan uh, that was uh, formed by Li Shizhen. So there's really some interesting people. Other interesting people on the left block of the cluster focus, that's where you find the University of Paris and University of Berlin, clusters 11, 12, 14, and 15. And you only have two students from the IFCL. There's less, there's 35 individuals. But what's interesting is they're proportionately more Communist Party members. There's also Qing Nandong, uh, people like Li Huang, and one European Guomindang. So they don't have a lot of Guomindang there. Uh, but this includes the very, very famous uh, Qian San Chang and his wife Hoods Away. Uh, Chen Ke is in this cohort, and Xu Dehung, who uh, already we've had a brilliant uh, discussion of uh, by Professor Rudolph. And here's a giant Chinese Democratic League photo in 1946 uh, where uh, Li Huang and Xu Dehung are important. And I wanted to show you as a methodology, once you do the cluster analysis, you can actually uh, uh, go into and get all the variables and attributes here, and you can see which clusters typify. Do you move your columns around to what's important, which have the highest affiliations? And that's why we can see all of these. I strongly recommend you think about tabular and tables to help you. If, if you don't have to show it because this wouldn't be very good as a, as a demonstration, but it is good for your analysis because then you can show it this way. And you can actually put in percentages or talk about it with people. OK, so what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to go um, to orange and, uh, and show you just a, a little bit about that. Let's go back to here. So note, this is a, the little presentation on how to download it. Uh, the download's very slow, and hopefully some of you have downloaded it. It's based on Python. Although tools will be covered in the workshop, you might try going to add-ons and add the widgets. They're called widgets for visual and unsupervised. Just like uh, the demonstration Alex gave, this is very graphical. It's a schematic, so it's very, very easy to use. You do not have to do any programming yourself. Let me go here. And let me show you how this uh, works. So when you go to orange, it has, here's how you add widgets if you have, haven't got them. 
let me explain. Okay, so I actually went to the Orange uh, workshop, or not workshop, a uh, place where they work at the University of Ljubljana because we were in Slovenia. And uh, this is also the home of Podject, another very important database. Let's go. Let's see. Okay, so that's going to work just like that. Okay. So this is the data set that I was just working with. And so I'm gonna replicate what's on here. So you have, uh, you put down file and that's the first step. You look in the file. So here you go and you always uh, check here, down here that there's 188 instances, 175 uh, attributes with two meta attributes, which I'm gonna show you what that means. And then you put in your data table. So you can see where I'm ending up on the bottom there. Now this is the output. And then if you do something on this side, it's called input, okay? Now you can do it that way. Let's remove this for a second. Or you can go like this. And if you stop, this gives you all the tools you can use. So you can do any of these tools in, uh, in, in the set. So file will give you that, or you can just link it. Now, always check that your data table has your uh, data and the question marks are missing data for those. Okay, you wanna make sure that works. And it'll tell you with a red mark if you're not making sense. So for a heat map, this is how easy it is to do. You go to unsupervised and you put in two widgets. You put in distances and here you go. And you put distances on the input for distances and, and you check your distances. Now I'm gonna put a step-by-step -step with screenshots on how to do this. So I will put this on the conference work workshop uh, site, which we'll have access to. Here's your choices. You can do rows, which in this case uh, are, are the uh, people, or you can do columns. You can actually do attributes. You use your distance that I'm talking about, the distance metric. And that's why I made the big deal about Euclidean. I use Lucidian, but you have all these other distance metrics you can use. Generally, I like to do normalized because that makes things consistent across data sets. And then you put hierarchical clustering. And here you go. Uh, actually, let's put it up here because uh, you know. And there you have uh, the CSE database and the various clusters. You see here what I mentioned, Sai Chong, Li Fu Chun. Now this is already uh, there. One of the other clusters that really is great is Li Li San, Zhao Xian, Wang Rafei, and Xi Xianping. These three individuals, Li, Zhao, and Wang, were very, very close in point of fact. So I know I sort of have it. And, uh, but that's where you as an historian come in. So here's where you make sure you do the linkage. And so the first one is I do ward, but you could do a different linkage. You could do weighted, you could do complete average single. In other words, allow more people uh, to link together. And in this one, what if you want Chinese names, you can set it up here. And there you have um, Chinese names represented. So, and then you can at the uh, zoom it, so if you wanted to see things uh, on the screen a little bit more clearly, you could do so. Let's uh, go here. So you can actually read it, you can zoom. Uh, you can uh, uh, regulate the pruning or the height ratio. I, I, you know, I just let it go automatic. At the bottom of the screen, one of the features which uh, Orange has that's terrific is it goes through uh, all kinds of help to you. And you can link to other help, like what is clustering? What is a dendrogram? And it tells you what these linkages are. And it gives you examples of workflow. Uh, so anytime you need help on anything, 
uh, and you can actually get the help on the widgets is uh, that help down there. You can save uh, as, so it gives you, that's why I was saying PNG, S, the scalable vector graphics are really good because you can then see it and that's seen through HTML actually. And you can uh, give yourself reports on this, which will report you know, things that you are doing. So I wanted to show you this one because I wanted to show you the Chinese uh, names could be done in Chinese. Okay, so now uh, I would like to open another one and show you the uh, ECCO. Also, I was able to do the Chinese names. Uh, actually, no, that was ECCO. So on this, this one that we had uh, just done was, So you can see, if you zoom it pretty, pretty high, you can see uh, here's all the names from this one in terms of if you only had four clusters, which you wouldn't want to do. Now, this is a way that you change. And actually, this wasn't normalized. So I'm not going to use this one. Um, if I don't, I'm going to erase it. So I'm going to show the data that uh, I'm, I'm going to do. Uh, for the Luau, that's the heat map. Uh, open. Okay. Actually, let's see. So again, you can always change or whatever, look at your data set. This blue folder allows you to look at your uh, data sets. And I have here already prepared to go the ranged data set and reload it. So that red light disappears, make sure it's ranged. And I'm gonna go through what range data is in the second half, but you can see the data table is over here. You want to check your distances. Always check normalized because otherwise, on the scale, you can get, uh, you know, 1,000, 4,000, 100, whatever. Euclidean. I'm just going to do the rows. And this is uh, the 20 uh, parts of Paris, the 20 arrondissements studied in 1873 by Toussaint Lua. And this is how they go together. And uh, this is by the names, which is uh, using word linkage. Again, you can zoom it, whatever. And you see a more regular scale up there when you plus uh, normalized. Okay, so uh, I wanna stop and ask if there's any questions now on the hierarchical clustering. So it's a question, how do you cope with multiple affiliations and or a change of affiliation over time? Oh, okay. So for example, uh, uh, you would have, uh, let's go to a different one. Well, let me just give an example from the, uh, you're still seeing everything. So let me give an example from my presentation. Let's go out of these photos and go to the PowerPoint. So for example, uh, in the, uh, Let's see. And well, John Roming and Yang Quinn, who both quit the party, uh, they are actually marked uh, as ECCO because they were there for some time. So this is one limitation is it's nice, it will be nice to have like Victor Schur does in his pay, in his wonderful work on the CCP Central Committees. He actually has time series, which you know they started and they ended. So one of the reasons I'm not putting my data set up there is that's really something that has to be done. And, you know, so Yang Quinn, 1922 to 1927, John Roming, 1922 to 1924, you need to put those things in and they're not in. But if they have an affiliation with it, it still should show up. So even if they quit, Ren Zhuo Xuan is uh, the most important ECCO member who was the third secretary. He quit the party in 27 and became very famous as a theorist on Sanmin Zhui for the Guomindang. 
uh, and uh, played a role. So you just, you, you just, if they have an affiliation, they put it in it. And because there's uh, 175 or 202 attributes, it all comes out in actual real, uh, real relationships. So one of the things here that uh, one could see is for example, Nier Rung Jun tends to be by himself and the communists tend to cluster here, whether they were from Charleroi or not, although they had a bulk of the people. So uh, like Nier Rung Jun is actually uh, cluster 10 here. Uh, but you see at the end, you have a Ho Chang Gong and other people. So very, very interesting the way people cluster together. Uh, other questions? Also say whether that's kind of pre-configured, like what of what you're just showing is pre-configured. And um, so how much is it uh, intuitively and how much do you have to um, uh, kind of maybe get to know the system before they actually... This is like the easiest program on earth to use. You don't have to configure a thing. You just go to these various, let me, so let me go over. Here's all the things you do. You push file, data table, you connect them. If you're gonna do hierarchical clustering, you do distances, you do hierarchical clustering. But let me show you something. On the data, say I remove that, okay? If I do a line, one of the things that uh, you, I pre-configured it to save time, uh, but you can, for example, get feature statistics. And uh, this allows you, uh, and I, I pre-configured it, I'll show it in a while, but it's really interesting. You get all the means, medians, missing, and this can be done in color. And it's really neat. There's very little you need to actually uh, do uh, to do these analyses. So I will do a fresh one for the uh, heat map and you'll see, and I'm gonna show you what goes behind it when I do the heat map demonstration. Would it be possible to share a small data set for these who would like to exercise? So maybe yes. you could say which, which data set you'll use when you just show it again now. Yes, so the one that I'm gonna use, uh, and I was gonna, I did use it for this one. If you look here in uh, the um, workshop materials, okay, this is, there's the download. This is the Lua uh, database that I'm actually gonna use. That's the resource used. And actually this is the whole uh, uh, study by Lua. And I wanna use this because it's, it's a lot of you might be even teachers who wanna think about preparing something for a class. So I'm gonna be using uh, that resource. And this is the, uh, yeah. And then I also have a whole series of readings, including a folder that explain about every one of these. I have a report on the CBD. And in the shared uh, documents, I also have a more detailed discussion of uh, the um, post-World War I data set in that and analyses. It's much explained much better than you can do in 10 minutes in the actual paper. And biography as historical analysis is about the CBD. And I give an example of the pruning table graph. So those are resources. I'm also going to be putting up this presentation and I am going to put up a, uh, let's see if I have it here. I'm also going to put up a step-by-step -step, uh, guide for Orange that has screenshots in it so that you'll exactly know what to do. And the data set is there for you to practice on. So anyone can practice with this. And you can just see, this is an example, for example, of the frequency statistics. You can actually look at every single attribute and get these uh, uh, graphs. You don't have to do anything for it. You know, you just have to have a well done data set. That's why I wanna use uh, what I am gonna use. So let me go back to the presentation. And I think this will become more obvious in the second example. Oops. So let me ask a quick question or make a quick comment. Sure. So I'm pretty, actually pretty new to uh, orange data mining. Um, and actually, um, I, I mean, it appears to me there is a very interesting difference between programs like GIFI on the one hand 
and Orange on the other. In GetFi or UCINet and many of the other programs, what you do is that you first import the data um, and then you do certain kinds of analysis. And if you want to use a different data set, you have to restart the process once again. It appears to me that in Orange, you can actually define um, the workflow in a pretty abstract fashion. You start with the file and then you generate distances and you do hierarchical clustering. So this is just a workflow. And then you can at any moment change the import data to generate different results. Is that right? Uh, part mostly. Uh, basically, it's the same process where you add your data set. You do add the data set. That's the, the both for UCI, UCI, I actually personally, I use UCI net more than orange, but yeah, I, you know, but the thing with UCI net is you have to then reload things if you make a certain change or two, and then you have to adjust it or you have to import your attributes file and so on and so forth with a, a you can actually in orange, you can have one schematic, two schematics, three schematics on the worksheet workplace that you're working on. It's, it's very convenient that you don't have to restart it and you can experiment at the time, it might not work out uh, and it gives you options at any moment. Also, there's, I should point out very good, this uh, wonderful woman, uh, Aja uh, uh, Pretnar from Ljubljana actually in beautiful English gives presentations on how to get started, how to do the workflow, but it's a workflow, it's a workflow but it's very adaptable and you can change your data sets at any time. You just need to go to the blue folder, find your data set you wanna use, go to the right and reload it on that sheet. And I'll show you uh, how to do that. Brilliant questions, very, very good. And I think this will make it clear because I'm gonna go more into the data set with this one. So the heat map is easily visualizes magnitude of values based on two or more colors where hue or intensity reflect the magnitude. So if you wanna graphically show where the hot spots are of activity or relationships or particular attribute, you can do it. I'm gonna show you several usages. Heat maps commonly use symmetric rows and columns with any chosen metric one can dynamically adjust low and high thresholds. And I'll show you how to do that for diverse color palettes. Low for attributes are generally the way it is and high for attributes with high values with two extreme colors and a neutral black or white color at the midpoint. So if you're publishing in black and white, it also has a version allows you to do that. It allows setting on an easily recognized midpoint value, but you can also uh, change that if you want. So primarily for creating cluster heat maps, but you also can do spatial heat maps to detect spatial relationships. So for the Christian uh, data, database, it would be very interesting to see Shandong in relationship to Jiangsu, you know, uh, how that goes. So this uh, are two examples. A lot is I want to demystify this for you that it's not something way up there elevated. We see heat maps all the time. This is classroom utilization heat map where you might have seen your registrar say, How often is that? We all know the struggle to fight over rooms to teach. So if you were in room 133, we can see it's mostly used during the mornings uh, and not so much in the afternoons. The right example is uh, a uh, one from science showing genes and C4 biofuel model. And it just shows how these tissues and stress correlate together for various tissue samples. And so the ones at the top here show greater va values because it goes from red, green for low, green for low, red, and this one for high. Now, originally there was a lot of black and white, and this is an example from 1910, published in 1914 on the 10 tests of efficiency for uh, education. And this was a national study by uh, Professor Brinton. I just wanna point out here, given that I might be the only person from the state, maybe I, oh, I do have a colleague who might be here from Washington, that, uh, so you see the first tier up here, uh, the first 12 states that have High children in schools, plans, school days, daily cost, high schools, students that go there, attendance, school year. And so white in this case means it's, uh, it's a greater value and the blacks mean it's not great value. So it's sort of reversed to normal. And you'll notice, you know, you're Massachusetts, New York, California, Connecticut. I just wanna point out that Washington state is number one up there. 
Uh, and then on the right is a very important graph because these are tables and I'll show you the Lua table and the history of it. But this table on the right is the first use of cluster analysis with the heat map. And basically what they do is they cluster together. You can just show the data in the data table like the one on the left, but if you cluster what links together more in a dendrogram, it allows the reader to really value more. So this is an example of a clustered uh, analysis of the Soviet return leaders I spoke about in my uh, panel presentation, where A uh, are the high intensity hotspots and the box is highlighted by white and mark. B are medium intensity. So we see the people like Zhou Enlai and Yaren Zhen and Deng Xiaoping and Liu Shaoqi, Zhang Wentian, they have a lot of high intensity, uh, whereas uh, people like uh, Cheng Gung or uh, Ouyang Chen or Lin Bo Chu aren't necessarily as high, although Xu Te Li and Lin Bo Chu actually have some. And if you go up here, you see uh, who they are. Of course, everybody's high with himself when, when that's, that's one red spot. But basically, you can really see uh, where the hot spots are. So you see, for example, here, Zhao Shiyan has a red spot with Zhou Enlai, which is important because Zhao Shiyan handed over leadership to Zhou Enlai in the European Communist cohort. You also see Li Li San, Li Wei Han, Li Fu Chuan, and Sai Chang form a, a, a very important cluster right there. And you can see they also cluster uh, with the other one. This is the original heat map, I think. This is a uh, Toussaint Lua. Uh, in 1873, and as far as I can tell, and if anybody has any other uh, knowledge, this is designed as a summary of 40 census attributes of Paris, showing the characteristics, national origin, professions, age, social classes, etc. That's on the bottom here. So, you know, he's population growth, which he has some fabulous information on, specific populations. These are the way uh, the menage is organized, the uh, habitation takes place. Uh, and uh, this is garrison, uh, nationalities, religion, uh, the uh, uh, li literacy, age, uh, voting. He has an array of professions, uh, social classes, uh, animals, which he selects two out of a big table, I'll show you, and death rates. So white is low through yellow to blue uh, is high. And basically, uh, the values for this graph were obtained uh, by entering in the original data uh, from uh, uh, Lua, and then that data was ranged, and it was uh, put here by his own tables. And I'll show you how he ranks it, so one knows what's the range for one, what's the range for two. So one means uh, the Louvre did not have a large amount of population growth, for example. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, uh, you can see Antropo and Poppincourt had large population growth. So this is really important. This is just a straight out heat map. And this is the original source, how the data, I obtained the data. This is, uh, and I put the whole statistic, Atlas Statistique online because I think it's a good teaching tool to show students, how do you gather the data? One of the research questions I ask. This is the one for animals. And one of the most interesting things is he only selects horses and dogs. And this is uh, card number uh, 39 on dogs. Uh, Lua only selected horses and dogs to put in the heat map, but he has many more in the animals, as you can see, as uh, cows, uh, bees, uh, dogs, uh, cats. Don't forget the cats. Actually, I don't know that he has cats. I don't see them. But he has chickens. And it's very interesting. Uh, each variable was characterized for high, mid, and low. And this is how he characterized it. So the maximum was high. So this is five. This would be four. This would be three, this would be two, and this would be one. So when you put the values in, then you recode it in this map for one, two, three, four, five, and you can actually then turn off the numbers and get voila, the original map. And you can see the original map match, uh, matches this uh, map, reproduced map based on the values can actually see it replicates it. 
So that's how the data looks. This is the increase in population. And he was trying to show he used 1866 to 1872 for his analysis published in 1873. And he goes into one of the things that's important about this is you'll notice there's negative numbers in that. Uh, and he, he goes into that. How do you handle something like that? This is also an example of his spatial uh, mapping. He does this uh, for all the uh, inhabitants per building. Again, uh, the highest inhabitation is Saint Laurent, uh, which uh, uh, Temple and Popincourt. So this is an example of the, uh, of the actual uh, data set and you have that data set, uh, but it's a range data set that I put up there. So you can actually use it in the analysis. This is what I mean by ranging and it's called data normalization. And this helps you use your data set and you're comparing apples to apples. For example, if you have a population increase minus set almost 8,000, and in attribute two, you have specific population is 388 people. How do you compare that? Well, if you normalize it, you're comparing apples to apples. And normalization is zero to uh, one. And in this slide, in the, I'll be putting this up so you can download all the slides. You have at the bottom, you can compare for each column. In this case, there's 40 columns. What is the maximum? And what is the uh, minimum? And, uh, and then you put in this, uh, this standardized in Excel, you put in this standardized formula for each of the, uh, you add a column, you put in this. And very simple in Excel, once you get your first column done, you just uh, pull the uh, down and it'll automatically replicate for all the RUDs more. But anyway, so you can see the maximum is 1877 uh, and minus 8827. And in fact, when you look at this column, that's what they are uh, for the zero and uh, the one. I think the one shows up here. Let's see. Yeah, here's the, here's the one, for example. And on the actual, and here's the zero. So you can see how that actually shows up and then you can use it in ranging. So the normalized data are then used to create new heat maps. This is how this heat map, there's three types of, or two types of heat maps that you can uh, do. This is the heat map with, and they're clustered heat maps. This just gives you greater uh, analytical usage with your data. So uh, we see here uh, that very low correlation, and uh, very high correlation with the red. And so we see uh, horticulture uh, is uh, very uh, highly correlated in, for uh, the, all of these first few uh, ones. We see children are highly correlated. Literacy is highly correlated. We see uh, uh, here uh, that you, you do not have a lot of uh, domestics affiliated with these first two. So, and the other thing that you can do because it's Paris is you can compare left bank and, uh, and right bank. And sometimes uh, these uh, are uh, correlated or actually have close proximity uh, together. So that can be very interesting. So um, uh, Elise and, uh, and others that correlate that are on the left bank. Very, very interesting. Uh, this is uh, the some, from symmetric mesas. This actually does the uh, attributes and the uh, uh, wards or arrondissements. This actually you can compare it by the arrondissements to each other, or by what kind of uh, uh, attributes correlate with what kind of attributes. Again, you you just need to get. Uh, symmetric matrices. So here you also have, I wanted to show that if you actually did clustering with the Lua, you, you can also get some really interesting correlations together uh, if you do based on these, these ones. So one of the reasons I picked the dogs is it's really interesting how closely the dogs actually correlate with apartments per house, uh, free thinkers, population growth, 
and strangely Lutherans uh, and Calvinists are not far behind. Uh, it's really interesting. One of the things Lua does not do is he doesn't have Catholics, which are the preponderance. He actually wants to see what the other uh, ones are. And this is the dogs versus number of apartments. If you actually just looked at the uh, statistics, it actually is almost a perfect correlation, as you could see from this scatter plot of the confidence interval and the prediction. So the p-value uh, is uh, almost perfect on this in terms of the correlation. So I'm going to summarize and I'm going to show you a resource and then I'm going to show you how to do orange for the heat map. You have numerous quantitative methods for historians that exist. You selection and usage depends on your research goals. Historians have an advantage with external references, a validation by the historical record. The greater the amount of data, this is a, an answer to what several of you have asked, the greater the reliability of the analysis. If you have one thing coded wrong, or you don't have a piece of information available to you, if the fact that you have hundreds of, of variables really helps them uh, to, to show the trend anyways. Many computer tools are available for data collection, organization, and vetting, analytical programs for most any research question. There are at least four ways to validate cluster structure, which I give in the presentation. The software is relatively easy to use and requires a small percentage of research time. Uh, hierarchical cluster analysis, useful for finding similarities and dissimilarities between, within and between clusters. Remember, you're only looking at the distance uh, of similarities and dissimilarities. It has a long history of usage. It's easily and quickly grasped figures of, and dendrograms, difficult to display information of large data sets unless selecting subsets. So you need to think of maybe doing panels of certain clusters. Heat maps can quickly identify hot and cold spots, large and small value zones, often used with dendrograms to show cluster structures. And you have different metrics. So I use the Euclidean distance and I had the slide in on Euclidean distance and the slide in on how you do linkages. And then I also have some resources here, uh, as was pointed out in, in uh, everyone's uh, presentation and Alex particularly, there's so many uh, uh, resources out there uh, and so these are some cluster analysis software. And I actually, you know, what's the cost? Are they free? A lot of the ones that cost something will allow you to download uh, for some time. This is heat map software. And then I had uh, some network analysis software, uh, Gephi and Cytoscape, Podjack and Orange. Uh, there's a very good one that actually uses HTML, ORA, and Carnegie Mellon. That's really interesting. I use a lot of UCI Net myself, Sysstat, uh, a little bit of Podjack, and Orange. And uh, I'm going to actually, I just wanted to show you the last slide, which is Oregon. I do have some supplementaries in case you have other questions. Uh, but I thought I would put that in so people could chuckle. And then uh, that's where you download Orange. So let me go out of that. And let me go and demonstrate how do you do a heat map in orange. So let's okay. So this is how the schematic will end up. Let me just make sure. Yeah, range only. Okay. So file. So this is how you use it. You go into the file. That's not the file that I'm going to use. So I go into here, I want to use, this is the one I'm going to use because I've ranged it. Okay, and I check that it's all numeric. And when you go in here, you can have numeric uh, or you can have categorical. Now here I actually have it configured for a cluster. Uh, and I'm going to show you something with that. In the, actually, I can just tell you, in, if you use a cluster analysis, you can download, save the database. So you can do that. I'll probably do that later just to show you because it's super useful. Okay. And, uh, and so we can see that that's it. You put in, there's four steps here, or three steps for this one. You just put the data table in. You link your output here to your input on the data table. Always check your data table. So show variable labels, color by instance, select full rows. Okay. And it gives you some information. You can look through it. So here we see the range to data. 
and it looks big because the uh, statistics always give you more than you need. Now the heat map is in visualize, and here is a logo for it. But there's all, all these all these ones you can do. You can do these charts and so on and so forth. So the heat map, you don't do the distance like you do for the hierarchical clustering. And here's the heat map. Oh, I'm just saying this is like so super. So you can select any of these. Uh, let's get this a little bit wider. Okay. Let's keep the aspect ratio. So you can do this as rainbow. You can do a lighter one. You can do blue, and green, yellow. So depending on what you want to do, you have a wide array of palettes and you can uh, control and you can control, uh, I actually like to use rainbow, but you can control your low value. So you see how this slides at the top here? So you can, if you have a lot of uh, things that are not clustered together, you can use the low value and you can put your high higher or you can put it at around a midpoint. So that just shows the relationships between these. And you can do it that way. You can do the original ones are basically not clustered, right? Uh, or you can use clustering like this. Or you can cluster uh, with optimal ordering, which I like to do. Uh, you can sort by uh, split by rows, column, it's not letting you do something. So one of the things you can do is you can show the legend. Okay, let me undo this. So this is it pristine. You can show the legend at the top, which gives your reader some view. The other thing that it does is it averages each row. So we can see uh, for the Louvre, you know that actually it's sort of somewhere if you did an average of what it was, it would be in the mid range. Uh, and that's really interesting of the uh, relationship with the attributes. Uh, here's where you put in, you can, if you, had a, if you had more or one identifications, you could put in Chinese names or so on and so forth. And there's other ones. Or you can keep the aspect ratio or not. I like to keep it. Okay, so that's basically how you would do the heat map. This is the Lua data. It's Lua data. It's like make the step to the data table. Always check it each time. Let me use this data for hierarchical clustering, and then I will take questions. So again, you have your space here. Now you could, for example, do Levain clustering. I think you need the data table. Let's see five clusters found. Let's remove that at a moment. So let's go here. Actually, let's get the table first. There's the data table. And you can save any of your results that you get on hierarchical clustering in a data table or an Excel spreadsheet. So here we have, um, actually, yeah, this is the ECCO one. So we see the data table. Um, Let's do this with this one. Now it goes to unsupervised is where you do the hierarchical clustering. So you put your distances here. Okay, I always push normalized. You can do rows or you can do columns. And here's this. Okay. And then you put in the hierarchy. And you have that. You can also put in the Chinese names uh, and you can manually manipulate many things too. Let's see, I think this is the one where you probably want to start doing that. Here's where you can save the data. So if you save the data, save, let's do save as, let's just go to the desktop. I want to save it as XLSX, save, okay. Let's see if it actually saved it. Yep. So it saved it. And one of the things that they do when you do cluster analysis 
is it usually has on the right here, the cluster number and your uh, field. So you just wanna cut these fields, put them to the right of your data set. And there, you know, you have all the insert cut cell. And you can sort by cluster and find out who's in what cluster, because it's one thing to look at the graph. So now you have the saved data set. Okay, and that would be saving that change. So this is incredibly easy. Anytime you're confused about what can I do with that, it actually gives you all kinds of ways to do something. You can do the frequency statistics, you can do all these plots, you can get data info, data table, so on and so forth. So it really is quite easy to use. Why don't I go ahead and take uh, some questions? We actually have already received one question and one comment. One of our conference attendees, thank you so much for your detailed instruction and sharing. Um, so that's that's the token. So that's an appreciation. Uh -huh. um, well deserved. Um, so now here's the question. Export function. How could you export the heat map as an image for the, re for, for the research paper or for sharing? Brilliant question. So here's how you do it. Uh, oh, that's the clustering one, sorry about that. So let's look at the heat map. Do you see down here on the bottom? So if you do save, it allows you to save it as a portable network graphic. Okay, so, you know, do that. You give it a name, let's say example heat map, or HM. Okay, and say I wanna save it on the desktop, save. Okay, watch this, it will just, save it for you. And you can save it in whatever one you want to save it at. There, you go. there it is. So anything you want to do, you can save it as a PDF. So when I'm writing papers, oftentimes I want to do PNG or, or uh, JPEG so I can insert them in the paper. So it allows you to do that save. Let's look at some other possibilities. So again, you can save that way in three different ways. You can, uh, you can uh, save the whole uh, schematic and everything as a report. Oh, thank you for that question, because one of the things you want to make sure of is if you're going out of orange is to, when you go out, you want to do save. So one of the things when you see here, I have, you know, uh, I do save as, and I save my worksheets. Why reinvent the wheel if you're successful once, you know, this is like that mom move, the blind person. Uh, doing it, I always save everything, you know, so that, uh, you know, and then I would say replace. And the OWS, the OWS is uh, the ones, once you do those OWSs, you can get those up and uh, it brings up there. And then you just go to the heat map and you have your heat map. And you can, remember, you can change the heat map. You can change the colors. You can change uh, all of this and you can change various, uh, various uh, events. So it allows you to save. And anytime you have a question, just go to the eye and uh, it will give you the workflow information. Uh, or if you uh, wanna do something like that, it, it actually gives you all the information on something. Oh, this is just for there, so, you know. That, yeah, so when you see the, uh, that was the information on that, you can get all the information on the data table, et cetera. Am I over time? Um, I think we can uh, uh, sort of go over time for just a few minutes to answer some questions. Excellent. Um, I love questions. Yeah. You guys are so smart and you're reminding me of everything I forgot. So keep going. Yeah. Um, so we have a next question. Um, how did you develop from a person doing interviews to a computer slash, uh, slash, slash, Database expert. Who interviews, you mean my uh, oral interviews? You, you, yeah, how did you be, uh, how did you develop from a person doing interviews to a computer database tech expert? Well, I am, first of all, hasten to correct the uh, misperception that I am an expert. I am not an expert. Uh, I, I uh, don't think I'm there yet. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, um, I have a philosophy uh, in terms of methodology that may be a little different. 
when I was a student at the University of Chicago, Professor Irie asked me, he said, what kind of uh, history do you do? And, I, and he wanted me to say social, political. I did take a quantitative class with John Codesworth. And he said, what do you do? And I said, if it works, I use it. My idea is we should really be thinking of multilinear, uh, multi-proof history. So what I've been doing in my recent publications is using different formats within one article. So I have in the presentation, uh, the first presentation I gave, I actually have some of the oral history there as well as network analysis and multivariate and univariate analysis. I think the more we integrate history, uh, the better we are. There's just a wonderful uh, paper by uh, one of my professors at Chicago, Zhou Dong, about macro and micro history. So how did I develop? Just do it. Just assume that you can get help from people. Uh, one of my colleagues, John Bowen, taught, he actually created a macro that I could use to convert my database, which was done in Microsoft in the last, you know, to 1997. Uh, how could I actually use it in utilizable spreadsheets? How we land at University of California, Berkeley, also with tremendous help. You can get help. There's a great network of you. We are all resources for you if you're beginning. But truthfully, just go through step by step, learn to do it, and use multiple methods. Um, one of the things I was very encouraged by the paper on word, uh, word counts is uh, I'm now a member of the uh, Ex Marseille. Uh, elites network power uh, project. And one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to use those 308,000 textual characters. And I hope to also do word analysis uh, based on the participants. And I could see us doing three clusters and then I can, we can do a lot. And there's just it's such a rich history and we can get through it through many windows. Quantitative is one of them. Oral history is one of them. Why not use all of them? And so I don't know if that's actually your question, but I hope I answered it. No, I think that's a wonderful answer. Um, so our last question, can you save the whole project, including file, data table, heat map, et cetera, and then you can work on them next time? Absolutely. That's what this OWS is. As long as your file is in the same place. So if, it, if you, you say, for example, you put your file somewhere else, you can load it from a different file uh, and uh, that will work for you. And so, yes, you, you absolutely, all you do is when you get out of it, you do save, it asks you uh, where you, you could save it in multiple places. So save as, look at this. Say I want to save that on my desktop. I save it. Okay, am I actually demonstrating? Uh, so I don't want to go ahead and save that part. But look at how, cancel, look at how this will work. It's now saved here. Bring it up. Look at that, same workflow. And it will still work because the database is there. That's the ECCO database. Uh, this is the Lua database. So I get the heat map from here. I get the hierarchical clustering from here. OK, and uh, I can do that. So you, you, know, you can do uh, it all on the flow. And then you can change, or you can, uh, th this was the data that I saved. And then I can get the. Uh, that big table. I actually did 588 people for the Revolutionary Roads paper I did. And getting that big summary table really helped me uh, with the, uh, it really helped me with the, um, with that. And I wanna go to this guy here because he's so cute. Okay. So uh, other questions, please ask them. I'm here to help. Um, we have one more comment, which says, great presentation, Dr. Levine. <laughs> and I think this is perfect for, uh, this is the perfect sentence with which we're gonna end today's session. Is that okay? Um, if you have any more questions, I think you can always reach out to Dr. Levine by email or uh, by any other means. And I think, and I believe Dr. Levine will be more than happy to take on those questions and, and answer them. <laughs>